So a lot of you have asked me to comment on quantum computing, and up to this point, I haven't really. And there's a couple reasons for that. Number one is that uh, quantum computing is probably not going to be useful for the things that you guys think it might be exciting for. It's really going to be useful for things like um, cryptography, uh, material science. And from a scientist's perspective, the material science uh, possibilities of quantum computing are phenomenal. Um, that will result in you know nanoscale batteries, uh, breakthroughs in, in chip design, and that sort of stuff. But it's probably not going to contribute directly to artificial intelligence, at least not yet. Now, IBM does have an entire division dedicated to quantum AI, uh, but it remains to be seen, especially uh, since generative AI is kind of all the rage right now. But what I really want to call your attention to, and I'm honestly surprised that a lot of the other uh, AI uh, YouTubers out there haven't talked about this, and that's not to throw shade. It's just I've kind of ceded ground to them to cover the news. Um, but this has been a drastically overlooked topic, and that is thermodynamic computing um, by Extropic. And I know that it's overlooked because they have 81 subscribers. Now, the guy presenting here is Guillaume Vaudan, um, which I'm probably saying his name wrong. I apologize. Um, but he's also known as Beth Jezos. So he was the guy who started the EACC uh, movement, the Effective Accelerationist Movement. So the TLDR is that there's what's called the Landauer Limit. So the Landauer Limit is the theoretical like bottom of exactly how much energy it takes to do computation. So some of you out there will talk about like, turn the light going into computronium, which that's a thought experiment that's not actually going to happen and you don't want it to happen. And anyways, the universe is a computer. So it's already computronium. The universe is already computronium. That's all that the universe does is process information. What this does, what thermodynamic computing, is it actually structures matter in such a way that it intrinsically does computing for you. Now, there were some, uh, at the rise of, of transformer technology, particularly back in 2018, 2019, 2020, um, there were a few papers that came out that they used uh, the natural like harmonic resonance of materials to create very simple neural networks. So these were neural networks that were hardware-based using the way that um, sound and light propagated through materials. And these can basically operate off of ambient energy. Um, now, pretty much all you need to do to make anything work, any machine work, is an energy gradient. And thermodynamic computing uses a thermodynamic gradient uh, or a thermal gradient in order to just intrinsically process. Now, what this does is it drastically lowers the cost of compute in terms of the watt, the, the amount of watts that you put in versus the amount of pro, uh, like uh, instructions that you get. Um, and that has been if if you chart the like the watt energy per uh, per you know megahertz or whatever it's been going down exponentially as Moore's law has been going up exponentially. This is a paradigm shift. Um, so I am much more ex excited about extropic uh, in terms of what it's going to do for artificial intelligence and what it's going to do for the accelerationist movement. Um, and of course. Uh, there are plenty of people that say, like, we're not ready for this. If you create something that is just going to uh, accelerate things, you know, by a factor of 100 or a factor of 1,000, then that gets us closer to AGI and ASI too fast. Now, I don't think that's necessarily going to happen because we are coming up against um, limits of data. We're coming up against uh, algorithmic limits. And I think that in order to get artificial superintelligence, we probably need one or two more major paradigm shifts. And so what I mean by a major paradigm shift is something as significant as the invention of the transformer uh, model architecture. That is like the basically the way that I think about it is the transformer is the new CPU. So we have the we have the new basic unit of compute that will get us that'll be a component of AGI and superintelligence, but there's probably another basic architectural algorithmic breakthrough that we need to get there. But what what the thermodynamic computing will do, this I believe very well could be the computing of the future. Now this guy's a really sharp guy. So Guillermo had a debate with Connor Leahy, and it did not go well. Um, Connor clearly knows more about philosophy and decision theory and risk profiles. Um, but at the same time, Connor's approach is very much like lording over you, like I'm smarter than you, therefore you're wrong and you're evil. And literally in in like the pre-interview thing, he like he actually said that like Jeff Beth Jezos is evil. And I'm like, okay, that's a little hyperbolic. Um, so anyways, uh, take it take, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, it's a, a very highly polarized <laughs> conversational space. So anyways, moving on. 
Uh, this is Extropic's website. Definitely pay attention to Extropic. Uh, go subscribe and just watch more of their stuff. So you know what they say, don't ever bet against Ray Kurzweil. And this is why, is because we have this data over a very long period of time that shows a very clear and consistent trend. This is Moore's Law. This is why we can believe um, in, in uh, Moore's Law. And we can also make predictions based on it. Now, a lot of people have been saying that like, oh, we're at the end of one uh, S-curve and at the beginning of another. That is a faith-based argument, and there's not really the data to prove that. What I will say is the only durable long-term trend that we have is Moore's Law. Now, at the same time, um, when you take a numbers first approach, and that's how Ray Kurzweil has been able to be so accurate since over the like last what four or five decades, is because he takes a, a first principles, which is a shorthand for a numbers based approach, as to being able to make predictions. So we don't know that scale is going to hold out, and in fact, there's plenty of evidence that scaling transformers is going to give out or is already giving out. Um, so is it going to be another S curve? Who knows, but this is the only durable trend that we have. Could something like extropic breathe life into that? I don't really think so. This is a, this is not necessarily contributing directly to artificial intelligence, but this could be the next step that gets us that gets us a little further along um, this curve. So this goes up to 2020, and you look at the you know the calculations per second per constant dollar. Um, that's one way of looking at it. You can also look at the calculations per watt. Um, I don't have that chart brought up, but it's, it looks basically the same, is that the number of calculations per watt energy has also been going up exponentially. And I honestly think that that this kind of technology is what's going to keep Moore's Law alive. So while it's exciting, you know, when in doubt, zoom out. That's kind of the, the mantra here. And I know that that comes from Wall Street Bets, but it's really good advice. When in doubt, zoom out. The only trend that we really understand that is durable is this one. This is the primary trend who knows why it's been so durable? Like there's, you know, we can talk about that for, for years. I mean, they have been talking about it for years, but the data is the data is the data. So another thing that I wanted to point out, um, this is something that has been talked about a little bit more extensively um, in, the, uh, in the AI space is the implication of robots. So a lot of, uh, you know, let me just take a step back and say, yes, I am one that is saying, AI progress is slowing down, but I'm also going to be the one to say that like it kind of doesn't matter. And a lot of you have pointed that, this out in the comments where just because, you know, even if we freeze AI models where they are today and we only just deploy them more and learn how to deploy them, the technology that we have today will take years to figure out how to fully maximize the economic value of. We don't even have the tools yet. It's like, imagine going back to 1900 and giving them, giving them a Ferrari V12 engine. It would take them years to figure out how to use that engine appropriately. This is kind of where we're at with robotics and uh, large language models or multimodal models today is we can recombine these new technologies. So I'm I frequently talk about the iPhone moment, which is a recombination of several technologies. So battery technology, minor miniaturization, um, digital data, LTE technology, um, touch screens, uh, a few other technologies. You put all those together, you get the iPhone, which creates an entirely new market segment. You combine robotics, language models, vision models, and a few other things. You're gonna like we're we're seeing the birth of an entirely new industry here with these kinds of robots. Um, and so the long-term implica implications, like yeah, it might not seem too exciting right now, but go rewatch like iRobot with Will Smith. Um, go rewatch the Animatrix. Like that's kind of what we're building. Hopefully, not quite so dystopian and destructive, but a world in which like humanoid robots are as numerous as us. And it's really difficult for the human brain to wrap or <laughs> wrap itself around the, these kinds of implications. Because I mean, as a lot of you will point out, things like ChatGPT and Claude are smarter than a lot of people that we meet on the street. Seriously, like I tried to take my car to the dealership and it took them 10 minutes to explain that they just weren't going to work on my car because they weren't smart enough to work on my car. And I'm just like, wow, imagine 10 years from now when you just have a mechanic robot and it says, oh, I haven't seen this car before. Let me download the package. But instead, in, an entire shop of human mechanics said, this is this is above our pay grade. We, we, we're not capable of working on this model of car. We can only work on this other model of car. And I'm just like, yeah, human jobs are doomed. <laughs> Sorry, that's just where I'm at. 
And so then you see that we've got Figure, we've got Atlas, and that's just a couple of companies. There are literally dozens of companies building humanoid robots. And that also includes Disney. Now, I've mentioned Disney before. They are inexplicably just using it for animatronics and entertainment purposes and for stunt doubles. But they've got some of the best animatronics in the world. <laughs> so anyways... I just wanted to point out that like, okay, we've got a few breakthroughs that are happening and yes, it's not quite as exciting as like, you know, AI is going to be PhD level, but the thing is we don't need PhD level AI to change things drastically. Like that is super overkill. If you put like a PhD level AI into a, a robot that is going to be used for cleaning your home or working on your car. Now, don't get me wrong. I would love it if a rural mechanic shot one of these robots and was able to uh, just take it and run with it and say, okay, look, the, anything you want to work on, anything you want to build, anything you want to fix, we got it. Um, you take that kind of, of ability because, again, you can put a hard drive in these robots and it can have literally all of human knowledge uh, ready to go. Um, you know, what that, what that changes for the future in terms of uh, healthcare in rural places um, or anywhere really, uh, what it changes for healthcare, what it changes for construction, what it changes for research. You know, Sam Altman and, and OpenAI, they're like, oh, well, it can't invent new physics yet. Most humans can't invent new physics. It doesn't matter. Like, yes, we will, we will get to the point where AI has superseded humans in every possible benchmark. It's coming probably within five to 10 years, maybe 10 to 20 years. We might come up with algorithmic uh, uh, barriers that make it harder, but you don't need that to get to a hyperabundant post-labor future. We have most of the technologies to create that hyperabundant post-labor future right now. We just need to implement them and deploy them. That's why I'm, ta I'm constantly talking about like, guys, the technology is there. We just need to deploy it and implement it. And it takes a long time to transform a, an industrial economy to a service economy. And it's going to take hopefully not quite that much time to change the service economy into an intelligence economy and automation economy. I don't even know what it's going to be called. Um, anyways, so that's my rant for the day. Cheers.